Welcome to the Night of Remembrance. My name is Sarah Thompson, and it's my pleasure to have you to join us for this special service. This year has been a time of great loss, not only of our precious loved ones, but also of the very way of life as our world has impa been impacted by a pandemic. It's been said that every change is a loss and every loss is a grief. In this way, we all have experienced grief and loss this year. The experience of depression and anxiety has increased as our world and communities face fear related to uncertainty, contagion, the health of loved ones, racial unrest, political division, isolation, and more. We've lost our common ways of gathering for worship, for celebrations, and for comforting friends and family when our loved ones die. While so many more examples could be named, it simply comes down to this. It's been a lot to deal with. And we need spaces for grieving, ways to slow down and care for our souls in the midst of it all. If you are acquainted with Jesus, you know that he cares tremendously about our souls. In fact, we celebrate his arrival during the Christmas season because he came to save and restore our souls. He entered into the darkness of our world and he gives us hope. So this night of remembrance service is designed to create the space we need to acknowledge the earthy realities and sorrows that we experience and to bring those realities and sorrows into the very presence of the God who loves us. So as we begin our time together, I'd like to invite you to light a candle if you have one available. It's entirely optional. And it is simply a way for us to be symbolic um, if you're a visual person. And you can light more than one if you'd like. But as you light these, if you have the opportunity to do so, um, it is an example. It can be a reminder of a, a loved one we've lost this year. Or otherwise, you may choose to <clears throat> use the lit flame as a way to represent the Holy Spirit's present with you right now during this service. As Aleska sings for us, feel free to simply let the words soak in. Notice without judgment anything that you relate to and anything that your heart may resist. Please pray with me as we begin. Father God, we come before you knowing that you love us. Um, it's been a long, hard year, and we need space to be with you. And so we pray um, that you would just show yourself to us, Lord. God, I know and trust that you want to unburden us and to relieve us of our sorrows. You want to be with us in our pain. And so we just invite you now as we reflect over the year. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh 
Whatever my lot, you are still God. I will sing again. My God is still in control and still. Sing it is well with my soul. My God is still in control. And it is well. And my God is still in control, and still He reigns on His throne. Though mountains may tremble and sea billows roll, I'll sing it is well with my soul. My God is still in control. My God is still in control. The Bible tells us that God knows us inside and out. He knows all of our thoughts and emotions and all of the circumstances of our lives. And yet, because we're in relationship with him, he enjoys when we come to him with all these things the way good friends share their lives with each other. So we're gonna take some time right now to individually reflect on what has happened this year and talk about these things with God. I will begin our time of prayer, prompting you to pray about specific things, and I will pause for a few minutes, beginning each prayer, giving you space to silently talk to God on your own. If you happen to be alone in your setting, feel free to say your prayer out loud to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being our rock. Thank you that in Jesus, you have given us a firm place to stand especially when life gets hard. It is in light of your stability and trustworthiness that we bring ourselves before you tonight. We bring our stories, our losses, our thoughts, and our emotions to you. Even though we know that you know us personally, we want to share with you our emotions and our difficulties tonight, naming each one of them before you now.
Lord, we want to take time to quiet our hearts before you and reflect on this past year. Would you call to our minds right now the things that have taken place? Would you help us see where you were active and working that we may that maybe we missed before now? Help us to see, Lord. Lord, now we want to bring our needs before you in recognition of our dependency on you. You are the creator of this world and have all the resources that we need for life. Whether our needs are physical, emotional, financial, or relational, we ask you to provide for these things tonight. Lord, this gathering of believers assembled here online shows us that we are not alone in our suffering and trials. Some of us experience loss or hardship. Some of those experiences are fresh, while others you have already healed by your grace and with your help. And hardships are not a surprise in this life, for you, Jesus, said that in this world we would have trouble but to take heart, for you have overcome the world. So God, we thank you for providing others for the journey. Lord, we turn our prayers to focus on the needs of others. 
family members, friends, our brothers and sisters across our community and in our church, we lift them up to you now with these specific requests. Gracious Father, you are our refuge and our strength. You are an ever-present help in trouble. Because of these truths, we will not be afraid, even if our circumstances and our losses feel as if the earth is giving way or the mountains have fallen into the sea. Help us to be still and know that you are God, that you have our whole lives in your hands. Lord, as we sit before you now in these next moments, we want to simply rest in your presence. And since we know that relationship with you is a two-way street, is there anything else you would like to say to us personally right now? We're listening. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. We love you. Amen. Hello, this is the Simmons House. Leave us a message. We'll call you right back. Hey, Dad. Uh, not returning my calls. I've left a couple calls. We're worried about you. She meant something to all of us. She was my mom. We're all struggling. It would really help if we could just talk to you. Why do you always close up like this? Now of all times, I miss you. I need you too. You need us. 
nadie más. Dear Papa, I miss you. I've been thinking of you. So I mailed you a present. And a story. The present is a bracelet I made for you. The story is what the bracelet means to me and how it helps me when I feel sad. It helps me when I miss Grandma. Green. That's the color of the first bead. It stands for the beginning. It stands for creation. Our creator. The king of the world. It stands for all the beautiful things he made. It stands for me and you. Because we were created. And so was Grandma. The blue one stands for sadness and sin the cause of all sadness and regret. It represents what I felt when Grandma went to heaven. This is where scars come from and what Band-Aids are for. Next is the red bead, the rescue. Because if we come to Jesus like a child and trust in him, he will save us. Lucky for me, I'm already a child. But you can believe like one too, because there's hope and restoration. I probably spelled it wrong, but you know what I'm saying. It means that all the things that are broken will be redeemed. So no matter how many times we try and fail, and try and fail, Jesus loves us. And that's the yellow bead, which reminds me of the brightness of heaven. I hope you love my gift. I hope you like the story. Dad says you would already know it. Mom says you might like my perspective. I told them you may just need to remember. I heard Dad say he couldn't reach you. At the church, you looked mad. Mad at God, I think. But never forget he loves you no matter what. He's not the taker. He's the giver. He gave you grandma. And he gave me you. It's hard not to love him back after remembering that. Sorry, I missed your call. I'm finally back.
Henry Nouwen said, there are two extremes to be avoided with regard to our pain. One, being completely absorbed in your pain, and two, being distracted by so many things that you stay far away from the wound that you want to heal. While I don't know your story and the pain that you bring to this service and how you typically respond to painful experiences, I do know the God who loves you, who knows your story, and wants to be with you in your pain. Consider this comforting truth from God's word. In Isaiah 43, God says to his people, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. None of us wants what wanted whatever sorrows or rivers of difficulty that have come our way. But we can see God's promise here is not that we won't go through deep waters, but that when we do, he will be with us. There's an intimacy and friendship in that. God wants to be with us in our pain. I wonder if we push too quickly through our pain, would we miss out on noticing God's presence there with us in it? I was recently reminded of a story that Elizabeth Elliot told. Some of you may know her story. She was a missionary to an indigenous people in Ecuador in the 1950s. She and her husband served with four other missionary couples on the field and were interested in reaching more tribes who had never heard the good news of Jesus' love. One such tribe were the Akas. One day, after careful planning and considering the risks, the couples agreed that the men would attempt to make contact with the Aka people. At that time, radio contact was their only source of communication, and the men were expected to check in at a certain time. That time passed with no word. Hours became days, and the women volleyed between reasonable explanations for the delay in the communication or the worst outcome. During those agonizing five days of waiting and praying, Elizabeth said that these words in Isaiah that I read earlier came into her mind, and God reminded her, when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. I love Elizabeth's honesty when she admits that she didn't really want to go through the deep waters. If it meant an end to her time with her husband on earth, she didn't really want that. She wanted God to build a bridge over those deep waters and to avoid that pain. The thought of his death during those days of waiting felt like it would devastate her, like the grief would consume her. And yet, there were the words of God. When you walk through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fires of oppression, you will not be consumed. She knew that God's promise was not that she would never experience hardship, but that he would be with her through all of it. It was a timely reminder of God's faithful present to her just before they learned that the worst had indeed happened and all five men had died. But sorrow was not the end of Elizabeth's story and neither does it have to be ours. Sorrow has a way of expanding our souls Jerry Sitzer says that souls are like an elastic balloon, and when they experience suffering, it grows large. At first, it's enlarged by our initial response to grief, by our greater capacity for feelings of anger, depression, despair, anguish, anguish and all the legitimate emotions that go with loss. But once it's enlarged, the soul is also capable of experiencing joy and strength, peace and love. And I believe that this expansion that happens in our souls when we allow ourselves to face the pain and grief is a result of allowing God to enter into that space with us. His presence changes our fear to trust and grief tends to slow us down to make us reflect to help us see our priorities and increases our dependency on God. 
the Holy Spirit in our lives then becomes our strength and his presence in our life results in joy, peace, and love, and more. Do you hear the language of cooperation? The language of God being with us is all over the Bible, but we have a choice to be with him back. Richard Foster said that God is always inviting us saying, I'm with you, will you be with me? It's our choice to allow God to be with us and his presence can make all the difference. So God is capable of transforming us in our pain. He's capable of filling our souls that have been enlarged from grief with new perspective and with a contentment in our relationship with him. This doesn't happen quickly, but over time, and especially as we continue to be honest with ourselves and with God. So as we think about going forward through the grief process and through a pandemic, James 1, 2 through 4 presents a paradigm shift for us when he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I don't know about you, but I'll admit that my first reaction to a new trouble coming my way is typically not great joy. Is it yours? But I do know that that enlarging that happens from the grief does give room to good things. It's a good shift that James gives us in this perspective to consider that troubles test our faith and really do reveal what I really believe about life and about God. It shows me what I really put my trust in. And this is meant to be noticed without judgment. When you notice that your thoughts and your responses to pain don't match up with what you say you believe, it's helpful information. We can't change or surrender what we don't first see about ourselves. In this way, troubles really help us to grow and to mature. And maturity is what it means here in this passage when it says, you'll be perfect and complete. It means you'll be mature and whole. God matures us in this testing of our faith and makes us a bit more like our Savior, our Savior who entered a world in which he himself would suffer and endure. Frederick Buechner noticed that even the saddest things can become, once we've made peace with them, a source of wisdom and strength for the journey that still lies ahead. As I look to the future, I encourage you to consider this grief process that you're in as an opportunity for endurance and maturing in your soul and an opportunity for you to invite God to be with you and to give you eyes to see his goodness and love, his presence with you, and to guide you into all of your next steps. Take this 
mountain weight Take these ocean tears And hold me through the trial And come like hold again And even when the fight seems lost I'll praise you And even when it hurts my soul I'll praise you And even when it makes no sense to sing Louder than I'll sing your praise And oh, I will only sing your praise Even when the morning comes, I'll praise you. And even when the fight is won, I'll praise you. And even when my time on earth is done, louder than I'll sing your praise. I will only sing. So as we close our service, I want to draw your attention to this booklet that we've made available for you for the journey that still lies ahead. It contains ideas for simple practices for connecting with God while you grieve. For example, you will find the prayer of reflection that we did during the service in there, and you can feel free to make those prayers unique to you. You will also see many other activities um, and possible ways to connect with others for additional support listed here. If you don't already have a paper copy, you can download and print your own through a PDF that you can find at eastview.church NOR. I hope that you were able to experience God's love and presence with you during this service. So let's close by praying a prayer written um, from a book called Every Moment Holy. God, we thank you for being with us here tonight. We thank you for your closeness. We thank you for um, just your presence, your witness with us, and your ability to give us what we need when we need it. So give us strength now, God, to feel this grief deeply and never to hide it inside our hearts. And give us also hope enough to remain open to surprising encounters of joy that may come. In the midst of the pain of these days, give us courage, God, courage to live them fully, to love and allow ourselves to be loved, to remember, grieve and honor what was, to live with thanksgiving 
in what is, to invest in the hope of what will be. Be at work among these heartbreaks with good friendships, true fellowships, unexpected delights. Remind me again and again of your goodness, your presence, and your promises. Let me learn, O oh Lord, now to do this as naturally as the inhale and exhale of a single breath, to breathe out sorrow, to breathe in joy, to breathe out lament, to breathe in hope, to breathe out pain, to breathe in comfort, to breathe out sorrow, to breathe in joy. In one hand, we clasp the burden of, of grief, while in the other hand, we reach for the hope of grief's redemption. And here between the tension of the two, between what was and what will be is the very is of now. Let our hearts be surprised by and shaped by and warmed by and remade by the same joy that forever wells within the radi wells and within and radiates from your heart, O oh God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.